All right. All right. I think we are ready. Um, let me. Oh, is it? Uh... So, um, let's see. Who here has used uh, Lam uh, AWS Lambda before? Gotcha. Nice. Um, all right, and you guys all have accounts. You you uh, know how to get into it. Uh, sweet. Uh, so probably one of the hardest th things about dealing with AWS Lambda is is just getting the code onto the platform in the first place, so it will run it. Um, and that's what I wanted to show you guys how to do today. Um, uh, yeah, it's. Just got to remember how to do it on this one. Ah, uh, thank you. I literally just went back to Macintosh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully at this point you have the, uh, you have the, re the repository forked, you have it set up ready to go. Um, So where did I have the readme? Okay. So we're gonna go ahead and log in. Do you have a view of the Zoom? Just wanna make sure, sweet. So we're gonna to go to AWS and hopefully I need my phone because it's gonna ask me for that code. Well, I got a backup plan. Oh, there we go. All right. So we start off, we go into Lambda, create our function, we close that. And this is all just for the initial setup. We'll still use the repository. So I'm gonna do demo function live. Uh, yep. Yeah, make sure that you take a note of the function name because we're going to need that for our GitHub action uh, script later. Um, we're going to select Node.js 20. Um, and then for architecture, we're going to select RM64 because it's going to be cheaper to run run uh, over time compared to x86. Um, and let's see. We're going to go ahead and create a new role. Um, we're mainly just doing that to simplify things for the purposes of this. And then for advanced settings, we're going to go ahead and enable function URL. Um, we're going to set the auth type to none. So, and we'll go ahead and leave everything else default. We'll go ahead and create the function. Sweet. So that's already set up, but we're going to override it with our repo code. Um, 
now we're going to go over to uh port no it's i it's i it's i am in, in aws we're going to go to we'll go to users and i think i already have a policy created yep um everything in uh if you're familiar with like the, the concept of uh lease permissions for for security um aws runs on that pretty standardly um in our case um we really only need one right and that's to the update code function for lambda um and i'll go ahead and run us through creating the policy for this oh go ahead uh, Uh, yes, that's fine. Um, because you're gonna you're gonna create a user. Um, but um, so on um in the IAM page, go to policies first. Um, and then uh, go ahead and create. Uh, click create policy. And actually, we don't need to select a service. We're just gonna do the JSON. And then if you go to the repository, I believe, yes. Um, you can just copy and paste the um uh the the policy the policy JSON and just drop it into the policy editor. Yeah. And then uh, if you open another window and go back to uh, to Lambda, we're going to want to grab, I don't want to sign in again. I just want to, hopefully it'll just let me in. Nope. Oh. Let's see. OK. We're going to need to grab the ARN. So we're going to go back to Lambda and let's see. so on the function page, um, you'll see the function arm. Go ahead and, and click the, the copy button. Hopefully this won't kick me out again. Let, let me know if I'm going too fast. Um, so we'll go ahead and, and save that there for now. I'm going to recopy this. And paste in, uh, paste in the template from, from the readme. And we'll um, go ahead and paste in the function arm. And what this will do is basically um, for this policy, if we assign it to a user, um, it permits that user to only update, only update the function code for that specific Lambda function. Um, and we'll go ahead and it shouldn't have any errors at this point. Go ahead and hit next. We'll give the policy name uh, deploy to Lambda, let's call it live. And all you should have to do is give it the name. We'll hit create policy. And now we'll go to uh, users and we'll go ahead and create a new user. Uh, I'm just going to call this demo live. Um, we leave everything default um, and we just give it a name. We hit next. And we're going to attach policies directly in this case. Um, 
what did I call it again? GitHub. There we go. And then um, look for the policy you just created. Um, created, make sure the box is checked for it to attach it to the user. Um, we'll go ahead and hit next after that. And then everything. Sorry, say that one more time. Yeah, it's it's the same policy. It's just one I created earlier. Yeah. Um, and then we'll go ahead and create the user, and we should be all all set for that. We're gonna go. Um, we're gonna go back into the user. I think I. Yeah, we're gonna go back into the user. You'll create, um, you'll create an access key, and then on your fork of the repository, you go into mine. Let's see, Lambda serverless template. Um, you're gonna on your fork of the repository. You're gonna go to settings, and we're gonna go down to. Uh, secrets and variables, actions. And when you uh, hit create, um, when you hit uh, in on the user page for AWS, when you hit create, there'll be two keys, um, an access key and a secret access key. Um, uh, you'll you'll uh, create, you'll create the repository secrets with these names and then paste them in, uh, paste the values in. And then that's going to correspond over to our, our uh, GitHub action, uh, these specific secrets where uh, where the, the YAML file is going to grab them directly from the repository. Um, and then that gives gives your repository the permissions of that user. user. And you'll, you'll know that it worked. Um, you should know that it works because it will uh, work um, it shouldn't air out. Um, and then and then um, the final thing you're going to want to do is grab the function name that um, that you wrote down earlier. Ours is demo function live. Demo function live. And I'm going to go ahead and just use the uh, preset key that we had, or that I set up um, set up before the demo today. And then once we do that, let's see. So you know, let's close that. Yep. And uh, GitHub. Once you've, you've updated, like everything for the deploy to Lambda uh, action should be set. The only thing you should have to do is change the function name that's here um, and make sure that it matches character for character what you named your function in AWS. And as long as the region and, and, uh, and the function name are correct, it shouldn't have any problems finding it. Um, if you do need to change the region region for somewhere, for some reason, I believe it is defined. Mm -hmm. 23, thank you. Yeah, just right here. Um, just change it to the region code that you're using. Um, it, it should still work. And then once that's done, we uh, at this point, you should have the user set up. You should have a policy attached. Uh, the key, um, both the keys should be um, environmental variables on your GitHub repository. Uh, and then once we push this up, Actually, let's see. I need mean, this one's going to be demo function because that's what the keys are currently set to on that repository. Um, get a minute. Change function name. No, push. 
Um, at this point, you should have the workflow flow fully set up. Um, we'll know that it worked because we'll see this message instead. Um, that your function ex executed successfully. Uh, we're gonna go to get rid of this one. Let's see. And let's take a look at Lambda serverless. All right, what did it have issues this time? With? It might take some fiddling just to make sure you have everything fully set up, but there's the failure. Supposed to, yep, yep, yep. Yeah, um, and like all, all it's really doing is doing like very, very similar to like if you were building, building out the uh, the the pro the project for for deployment, you define everything here. You check out the latest remain. Um, you install Node on the runner runner so that it has everything that it needs. You run npm install to make sure all the packages are there and that they get included um, on the when you zip up all your code files for for Lambda. And that also helps because you don't have to, um, it, it also means you don't have to push up the actual node modules uh, with your with, with your files. It just gets built uh, um, right before it gets sent over to AWS. Um, some other things to note, uh, this method is really only effective um, up until the point your code is uh, 50, meg uh, 50 megabytes or less. Anything above that, you're going to have to upload your code directly to S3. Um, and then I think the limit for that is like 150 megabytes. So just things to keep in mind. Let's see what's going on with the action. Um, user demo GitHub action is not authorized to perform. Yep. It, it took me a couple of tries when I did this on my project to get it working. Uh, oh, I know why. I didn't save the name. Uh, Git, uh, uh, GitHub. Git commit dot m. Fix function. Fix function name and git push. All right, let's go back. We should see see this run. Um, once you have this set up, like any any time you push up a change, you should see it on your Lambda function in about like ten to fifteen seconds. Um, all right, here we go. It's running. There we go. Yeah, it was successful. Um. And then if we refresh the page here, I think this is, yeah, this is the one I set up before. That's what the initial setup, it's not as easy. And you can see your function um, executed successfully. So, and then I got one more thing to show you guys. Um, I want to show you how I ended up using this. So I'm going to uh, stop sharing on my Mac and quickly switch over to uh, my Windows. All right, who here likes video games? Nice. Uh, who here has played or dealt with Nintendo 64 cartridges before. Nice. Um, so this is gonna be kind of niche, but um, there's a super common problem uh, where uh, there's factories in China that will just churn out reproduction cartridges. They're not terribly, 
they're not great quality. They usually sell them for pretty cheap or some of the less reputable ones will try to make you think it's an original. Um, and like, and then in two months it dies on you or can't save, save anymore. So uh, a couple months ago, I, I did a hackathon with one of the AI meetup groups and we tried our hands an AI model to recognize, um, to identify uh, printing errors and reproduction cartridges uh, versus original. And uh, I did, I thought I did. Are they not hearing me? Yeah. Um, and so we, we built a very simple model had about 24 images in it, got really good at uh, identifying legitimate copies of like Mario Kart, but that was about it. Um, but um, I decided to, to take it a, a step further and I built a Chrome extension um, that helps you identify legitimate games from, from fake ones and just like, just make an informed decision whether or not like buying a particular game is a good deal or not. And I'm just gonna quickly demo that right now. Um, so we're going to start out with, uh, we're going to start out with Clay Fighter because that's a famous, uh, famously rare game. Um, and one of the very common ones that get, get faked. Um, if you know anything about what these games are supposed to be priced, uh, $22 and 87 cents is extremely suspicious for this particular game. I'll show you why. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and open up my Chrome extension. Um, and then we'll hit validate, give it a minute to run. And uh, once it runs, it sends the listing number from eBay over to my uh, Lambda function on AWS. Um, and then I grab all the information from eBay's API directly so I can do the analysis. Uh, you can see the price is listed as $22.87. And the market average for this game is a little less than a thousand bucks. So already right there, I'm like, I'm questioning whether or not this is a good buy or not. Um, uh, the, what gets dynamic, what, what, what gets dynamically generated is um, the, the list here. Um, we do the analysis to see like what percentage of the, uh, the, the, the game is on the listing compared to the market average price. I'm also checking uh, the description and it's detected that um, the phrase not for collectors or, uh, re or, or the phrase refur refurbished version is present in the description. And if we go down, um, yeah, right here, not for collectors. This gets done uh, by the sellers to just just scoop by eBay's listing rules, so they they can claim that they haven't lied to the customer. Um, um, and then finally, we have uh, the fact that the game is twenty plus years old and it's listed as new or like new, which is a high um, highly unlikely for for something that's out of the box and and um, not sealed anymore. Um, and then uh, once that's, then we'll go ahead and we'll find, uh, we'll find an, a legitimate copy. Let's use, I think this one should work. Nope, that was one of the cases I didn't cover. Uh, let's do, let's do Clay Fighter again. Let's do, let's do this one. That should do it. This is kind of an interesting problem to solve because um, it is highly reliant on what sellers put on or put it, the information they give in the listings. And so if they deviate from uh, the common patterns that most sellers have, it creates an edge case. Uh, 
Pro probably, but the only issue with that is it's going to nix some of the, it's going to prevent them from uh, using some of the keywords that, that are optimal for using eBay as a seller. So like, no, I'm, I'm still, I'm still trying to figure it because the API, my, my Lambda function is public and that's the only feasible way I can see for this to work. And so I'm currently working on trying to secure that as much as possible so that I don't have somebody DDoS me um, into to like $3,000 a month. Uh, you you can. Um, I, I was trying to make this as, as uh, the original goal is to make it free to the user. Um, what happens is when you use it, um, it drops, it, it uh, appends my uh, affiliate link onto the eBay listing. And uh, if they choose to buy it, it gets, um, I get like four, like three or 4% of the sales, sales price. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. I don't know if it's gonna be effective as a business model, but. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think this one, I'll have to dig, dig into why this one doesn't work. Um, let me grab one of the original ones I tested this on. Uh, like I said, it's a, it's, a it's a tricky problem to solve because you can't predict all of the things that will stick in the list, listing title. You can only get most of it. And one of the APIs I'm using is very uh, picky about, about uh, what, what I give it. Let's see. Let's do that's no, that's a new other. We don't want that one. This one might work. Let's see. <laughs> there we go. Um, so this one doesn't have any of the common signs that um, re reproductions have. So this, I mean, it's pretty clear this one's an original just because of the damage. Um, so uh, when none of the cases are detected, uh, my function just throws back a, a no red flags detected along with the pricing information. And that um, all that really means is that the rules that I have established um, for when I when I flag stuff hasn't popped on, on anything. Um, so this is probably a safe buy. Um, and then the pricing, the game is slightly above market average, but it's still within about 15% of where it could be. So like, it's an okay buy. Um, um, probably not, okay. Probably not something I would personally buy because uh, more than market, market average is not great for a uh, for game that's only acceptable. And has a damage label, um, but that's getting into another kettle of fish. So go ahead and show you some of the code. The uh, the extension itself is fairly dynamic. Like if you try to do it on a if you try to use it on a website that does um, that isn't eBay, it's going to display an air screen um, saying you got to use this on eBay. Um, and, and then the same thing if you try to run it on a, on a listing that isn't a video game. Um, and so we'll jump into, jump into my server code here. This will look familiar from my, from my code along from like 15 minutes ago. Uh, and then we have my full function right here. Um, we have the handler that kicks everything off right now. Everything's set up to kind of run procedurally since I only support Nintendo 64 games at the moment. Um, we go ahead and we scrape the listing um, by grab using the item number that gets passed from the extension over to the to the function um, function, um, and that lets us grab all the listing information. Uh, we pull the values we need off of that, along with the game name. Uh, and then probably the thing to know is this gets into kind of the complex part of, of uh, dealing with uh, potentially unlimited customer uh, um, 
custom input for titles. Uh, we grab, because there's two places in the listing, there's the game name and the, and the listing title. We grab the game name, we just do a direct, direct regex check to see if it's even included in the listing because there's, there's a couple of cases where you can have like the listing be for GoldenEye, um, but Mario Kart is listed as the game name for some reason in the details section because they used the template or they weren't paying attention. Um, and then if those two match, we just use the game name. We don't have to worry about anything else. Um, if they don't, we then uh, do this monster of a regex on, uh, on, on the listing title to basically kill everything but the game title that's there. Um, this is something where I'm considering just feeding it into uh, uh, open AI, AI and having, having them just get rid of everything except the game title for me. Um, other potential solutions is I have a list of every game I've ever made for the Nintendo 64. I can, I can do a, a many to one comparison, but I, I was worried about that being too uh, resource intensive. So I didn't end up implementing that. Um, and let's see, where was it? Yeah, we run through everything and then we have the actual uh, analysis that occurs. Um, it's really just a bunch of regex checks. Um, um, for each of the cases I mentioned. The only other thing really to note is um, in, in the case of if nothing is found and um, if uh, the description has one of the signs, um, I grab the, 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 main, the main image off of the listing and then I throw it into an S3 bucket that hopefully with, with, enough, uh, with enough usage of this tool, I'll, I'll have enough of a, of, a, of a data set that I can build a computer vision model to, um, to detect the difference between uh, original copies and, and, and remake copies of the game. Um, cause, uh, the real secret of AI is data collection is probably the most expensive part of the process, or at least the most time consuming. Um, and that's pretty much it. And I'm a little bit over time, so I will go ahead and end it there. Did... Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks everyone for coming and thanks for the folks that came on Zoom. Um, after the meetup and the when the Zoom recording finishes, I'll post it on the meetup event page. So if you wanted to review anything, you can go and do that. Uh, next month, we're meeting here again. Uh, Rob Richardson is doing a presentation on uh, unit testing. So that'll be really interesting. We are looking for a beginner uh, presentation. If there isn't one, I'll do some other interesting walkthrough again. And um, just make sure to clean up after yourself. And we'll see you next month. Thanks so much. Thanks.